So I'm going to talk about public policy and sort of how to think about public policy from my perspective. And I titled this sort of policy for development because, you know, that's what I work on, economic development and comparative economic development. And to be honest with you, I'm not that much involved in public policy. You know, and in fact, if you've read Why Nations Fail, what people usually criticize is the absence of a policy agenda. You know, okay, there's all this stuff about inclusive and extractive institutions. That's, where's the policy conclusions? Like, where's the policy agenda? And there isn't one. But, you know, if there was a policy agenda, then this is what it might look like. So I've been doing some sort of lateral thinking, and you know, you'll have to bear with me. There may be some rough edges, and, uh, but this is sort of where we're headed, you could say. Okay, so, but I'm, and I'm gonna start not with the agenda, but sort of where I began as an undergraduate. And I, when I was thinking through this talk, I sort of thought about, you know, when did I first start thinking about public policy? And it was when I was a student of economics at the London School of Economics. I actually started studying political science at the London School of Economics, but I couldn't really understand political science. It was sort of like there was stuff, you know, in the world. And this thing happened in Belgium, and this thing happened in the United States, and this thing happened in Sierra Leone. But then when you took an econ class, there was stuff, but this stuff was better than that stuff, you know? And that was like a sort of revelation. You know, we had some way of looking at the world and evaluating what was a good outcome and what was a bad outcome, and what could we do to push the bad outcome to the good outcome. And this I found very exciting. I was a bit confused to start with. There were all these words floating around I didn't really understand. And the penny dropped, I remember, you know, hopefully this will happen a lot while you're at the Harris School. But when I was a student, the penny dropped when I read a very famous paper called The Anatomy of Market Failure by Francis Bater. So it's a paper, it's in 1958, it's a very old paper, but it sort of summarized the kind of tradition of welfare economics that started with Pigou via Paul Samuelson and sort of characterized, you know, it stated the so-called first fundamental theorem of welfare economics, the conditions under which economy produces an efficient allocation of resources, and then it provided a really incisive kind of taxonomy of the circumstances under which the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics fails, and that's a kind of very powerful motivation for how to start thinking about public policy. So, you know, the familiar things, monopoly, externality, externalities, public goods, various types of market failures. And, you know, the power of that approach, I guess, which goes back to Pigou, is it's, it's not just sort of, doesn't just point out sort of syndromes that create inefficiency in the allocation of resources in the economy, but it sort of tells you what to do about it. It gives you a hint of, like, how would you make things better? How would you approach public policy? Okay, so, 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 so I'm going to sort of take off from thinking about Beta's uh, great paper because it was a great moment uh, for me when I finally sort of understood all of this business of what's so good, you know, what's so good about economics and what are all these politicians in England? This was the early 1980s in England, so economic policy discussions were very, very exciting. And uh, this was, you know, this was, this was where I started. Okay. So, but when I started studying development problems myself, and thinking about underdevelopment and problems of underdevelopment and solutions to underdevelopment, I was very influenced by a sort of critique of this approach to thinking about policy, which really comes from the work of Douglas North. Okay? Douglas North sort of emphasized, okay, that's good, but there's a lot of implicit structure in this discussion of the first welfare theorem, a competitive economy, free markets, property rights are well-defined, costlessly enforced. Douglas North, you know, if you go back and read Beta's paper, which I did last week <laughs> for the first time in 30 years, uh, Beta understood a lot of this stuff. It's a very sophisticated paper. He didn't really have the language or the tools that we have nowadays for talking about all these sort of implicit structure in this competitive equilibrium model. Uh, but he was well aware that there were a lot of other things that could go wrong, just from practical experience. 
He spent a lot of the time in the policy world before he became a professor, one of the founding professors at the Kennedy School, actually. Uh, but the Northian, what I'm going to call the Northian program, whoops, I'm going to come back to that in a second. What, what I'm going to call in a minute, the Northian program was to say, okay, this is a great framework for thinking about public policy, but it assumes a bunch of implicit things, okay, about costlessly, you know, well-defined and enforced property rights, market, market processes, exchanges costlessly enforced. And we sort of know, Douglas North said, that the world isn't like that, you know. And, you know, here's my example of the world not being like that, which is some work I've been doing in Colombia and South America on a sort of incomplete property rights. So it turns out, you know, if you go to rural Colombia, I mean, this is true in urban Colombia as well, but it's more intense in rural Colombia, most people don't have any kind of title to their land, okay? This is some data uh, we've been constructing with the National Cadastral Institute, and black, if you go to the black, this is between 40% and 100% of people in rural areas have no title to their land. So you're sitting, you have a farm, maybe you have a piece of paper that says, you know, I bought the land between the river and the mountain from Jose in 1982 for 2 million pesos, okay? But you don't have anything registered in the local notary, you don't have a government provided title. And this is absolutely enormous, you can see all over the country, along the Caribbean coast, along the Pacific coast, in the eastern uh, plains, okay? So, these people never got title to their land, okay? And it's even worse than that. There's lots of competing claims. Last summer in eastern Colombia, I was at a, I was at a, a, a municipality where there's a lot of African palm being grown, tropical palm. So I asked this entrepreneur, you know, there's all, you know, how did you get this land, you know? I mean, and he said, oh, you know, if you try to buy a piece of land in rural Colombia, five people appear and they say, that's my land, okay? So, so this creates a lot of underlying context which, you know, isn't really captured in Betor's uh, paper. And I think, you know, if you're, this is just one very specific example, I'll give you some other ones. But if you're interested in problems of development and policy problems of development, this is a not a typical kind of problem. Okay, so, so the Northian program sort of spun off uh, in the 1970s, sort of said, okay, all this stuff about market failures and externalities and public goods, the sort of thing Beta was talking about. That's all important, but maybe the big question in development is these underlying things that he sort of assumed were in place, such as well-defined enforced property rights. But what I want to say about that is not that that's not perfectly sensible. I've spent a lot of my academic career think thinking about that and trying to estimate the consequences for comparative development, for example, of insecure property rights. But what I want to say is that, you know, thinking about public policy, despite the critique of the sort of traditional approach encapsulated in Beta's paper, it didn't really make much difference for the way public policy worked. In fact, you know, people in the World Bank, for example, sort of just took this as saying, well, we used to worry about externalities and market failures. Now we just worry about institutions. So instead of public policy being about, you know, regulating monopolies, it should be about improving institutions. And there's a lot of work on that. You know, Hernando de Soto, the Peruvian economist, is the person most sort of famously associated with this. You know, we need to focus on giving people proper titles and giving people proper property rights. And so instead of just, you know, we just move attention. We kind of refocus on institutions. So when I was thinking about this, it sort of said, I sort of thought to myself, what well, this Somehow this Northian program never really changed the way we think about public policy. And just this summer, you know, the Colombian government's rural mission, it's called the rural mission in Colombia, basically, you know, one of its policy priorities is, you know, give every Colombian in rural Colombia a written title to their property. Okay, great. So that's, you know, this is, this is you know, this could be incorporated within Beta's uh, view of the world, all right? But I want to say, you know, not so fast, okay? And what do I mean by not so fast? Well, I think when I thought about this and I thought about public policy, it seems to me that the North program, at least the way I always interpreted it, is sort of saying something much more complicated about the nature of society. So it's not just that 
there's this underlying sort of functional world and there's a few problems. You know, there's a monopoly. Oh, regulate it. There's some negative externality. You know, tax it. Okay, or there's some institutional problem. Let's do something about that. Maybe the state can do something about it. Hand out some titles, for heaven's sake, you know, and set up a cadastral institute. So, so you know, it seems to me, going all the way back to Norton, Norton Thomas's book, The Rise of the Western World, that sort of laid out this agenda, is that there's something much more complicated about the underlying equilibrium in society. I'm not sure North really managed to characterize it, but it means that, you know, there's something kind of too simplistic about a policy advice which says give every Colombian written title to their property, okay? So if the underlying equilibrium, the underlying model of society is a bit different from what sort of Beta assumed, then, you know, maybe the policy implications could be rather different, okay? So what on earth do I mean by that? Well, let me sort of segue into that by talking about another layer, if you like. So first there was the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics, then there was the Northian program which sort of said, no, 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 some of these fundamental assumptions are not right, okay? Now, a lot of recent research in economics and in many other related disciplines has sort of said, okay, but you know, public policy and institutions like property rights, they're kind of hovering over or maybe they're embedded in society, okay? So this is work which is inspired, I think, from anthropology, and I'm gonna give you one very famous ethnographic example of what I have in mind in a minute, but it's sort of like saying, you know, if we wanna think about development, it's not just about regulating monopolies or externalities, it's not even really just about property rights or insecure or ill-defined property rights or sort of institutions the way North talked about it. It's about the structure of society. It's about how people relate to each other. So, you know, you can find many antecedents for this research, but I think within economics, it really dates back to the work in the 1980s, which started out as a sort of critique of homo economicus, this idea of sort of neoclassical economic man and woman who sort of had these materialistic preferences, they had a utility function, you know, they had a budget constraint, they made choices, etc. People like Kahneman, Tversky, a uh, psychologist started saying, you know, no, but actually, you know, people don't really behave like that. You may know this famous example of the dictator game. So in the dictator game, you give somebody like Kerwin some money, let's say $10. And you set up the following game. Cohen makes a decision, and let's say he's playing against me. And the decision is as follows. Cohen has $10. He has to decide how much to give me, anything between 0 and 10. And then he makes the split. I get some money. He gets some money. End of story. Now, you apply some sort of standard neoclassical economic theory to that problem. You get a solution very fast. He has $10. He could give some to me. The more he gives to me, the less he has. Cohen's a rational economic man. What does he do? He keeps the $10, he gives me nothing, we go home. Okay? Now, that's what economic theory, traditional economic theory, predicts. That's not what people actually do. In fact, it's extremely anomalous for anyone to behave like that. In fact, the usual thing uh, is that he splits it 50-50. Okay? So he doesn't know me, I don't know him, it's completely anonymous, I'm not married to his sister, we're not gonna interact you know, tomorrow and I'm gonna like, you know, shout him out in the street. But somehow humans are pro-social would be the word that's used nowadays. So this literature, which started out as a sort of critique of neoclassical economics, started emphasizing that, hey, people cooperate in situations where they shouldn't do. People are pro-social. People trust other people in situations where they shouldn't do. So people's preferences are different. I guess the, the scholar in economics who really kind of started this was Matthew Rabin, uh, who's now, now at, at Harvard University. And Matthew was the, one of the first people to write, really start taking this seriously and start writing down models of this. I don't want to emphasize um, this critique, this is, this is a critique of economics, okay? So, not at all. What I want to emphasize is the sort of view of society that emerged from this literature. 
Okay. In fact, you know, uh, a society emerges with interlinked preferences. You know, I'm pro-social to you, you're pro-social to me, I trust you, I cooperate with you, you cooperate with me, you trust me. So we have these very kind of interlinked preferences. Okay, it's a society. And underlying this, and a lot of very interesting comparative work that's going on at the moment, both by economists and other scholars, but mostly by economists trying to document empirically how this sort of thing varies across societies, and there's huge variation in the extent to which people trust and cooperate with each other in different sorts of societies. What I want to emphasize is that kind of model of society that emerges and how that interacts with these other layers, particularly this institutional layer and maybe even this uh, policy layer. Okay? And, you know, it's natural when you start thinking about this to, map, to, to model this in a social network, okay? So a lot of this work, I'll talk a little bit about some of the empirical work, is sort of formalizes this interaction in terms of a social network. Now, network theory is very fun stuff, and I'll tell you a, a famous result from network theory. Uh, uh, and, and just, so he's, these are networks, so I won't get into any sort of technical stuff. These are different sorts of networks. This is a social network of cow licking, okay? Now you take a herd of cows, cows go and they lick each other. You know, they try to build social capital, friendship, reciprocity, you know, uh, that's what cows do. Now, this is a uh, monkey grooming. Monkeys groom each other, you know, they go, they pick out the bugs and stuff from each other. Same kind of thing. This is a bit more, this is red deer dominance. So red deer, you know, they have territory, they kind of fight each other, red, you know, they come, you know. So this is, this is just like each link here is kind of looking at a kind of fighting between red deer. And this up here is a co-sponsorship of um, bills by the US Senate in the 1970s. So a political scientist constructed a social network of uh, how senators kind of interact with each other in terms of co-sponsoring. So the interesting finding in this paper, uh, you know, comparing networks across space, time, size, and species, is that they developed a kind of metric. It's not so obvious from the diagrams, but they developed a metric to sort of compare social networks. And it turns out that the social network which is closest to the uh, US Senate co-sponsorship is cow licking, okay? <laughs> so, so, so if there's one thing I want you to learn from my talk today, it's this, you know, this mapping from interaction between US senators and cow licking. And you know, perhaps it's a kind of similar, similarly motivated activity, okay? So this is just some of the insights that uh, network analysis has provided, which may be useful in the public policy uh, domain. Okay, but, but what I want to also emphasize about this way of thinking about society, so institutions are floating there, and now I'm talking about society, is that this model of, you know, interlinked preferences, we trust, we reciprocate, we cooperate, or maybe not, uh, you know, we give, we are pro-social, or, you know, that maybe that varies a lot, sort of suggests there's lots of interconnections. Okay, so there's lots of interconnections and things spread. There's lots of contagion in networks, you know, so if I'm unhappy, my wife is much less likely to be happy. My friends are less likely to be happy. If I'm overweight, my friends are more likely to be overweight, okay? Lots of things spread, cooperation, trust, obesity, even suicide. There's evidence on suicide spreads uh, through social network. And what's interesting about this world, kind of using a more technical language, is there's a lot of strategic complementarities between people's behavior in this setting, okay? And when you see the word strategic complementarities, at least when I see the word strategic complementarities, so that, you know, if I do something, you're more likely to do it. If I'm more likely to be trusting Cohen's more likely, if I'm more likely to trust Cohen, he's more likely to trust me, and we're more likely to trust Germany, and Germany's more likely to trust Luis, who's more likely to trust Austin, and so this, we're all more likely to trust. So, so you can have equilibria where everybody trusts each other, and, or other equilibria where people don't really trust each other, and these things can spread, and you can get multiple steady state equilibria. And it's sort of interesting in my, <laughs> I find it somewhat ironic that a literature which was originally motivated by trying to show that 
narrow, a sort of narrow model of human behavior predicated on sort of materialistic preferences. No, 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 we trust, we're more pro-social, etc. But when you sort of formalize those ideas, you can very easily write down a model with very, very inefficient equilibria, and maybe even multiple equilibria with very different implications for efficiency. Okay? And I'm going to illustrate that with a famous ethnographic example. Okay? So the fact that a poor country or an underdeveloped country is characterized by not just sort of insecure, ill-defined property rights like Colombia, but also somehow a kind of underlying society that's really not good at cooperating or trusting and not very pro-social, and there's some sort of symbiotic relationship between those two things, resonates with an enormous amount of ethnographic research. So one of the most famous uh, examples of that is a book by Edward Banfield. Uh, it's called The Moral Basis of a Backward Society, and it was an ethnography by a University of Chicago political scientist uh, of the poverty of a southern Italian uh, town. He called it Montegrano, that's not its real name. And he says, this book is about a single village in southern Italy, the extreme poverty and backwards of, backwardness of which is to be explained largely by the inability of the villagers to act together for their common good. So he kind of characterized that in a phrase he called amoral familism. It's a sort of like a social norm. The problem in Montegrano is that people all behave in the following way. The Montegranese act as if they were following the rule, maximize the material short-run advantage of the nuclear family, assume all others will do likewise. So it's a bit like the prisoner's dilemma. If you know the prisoner's dilemma, where it would be good for everybody if they cooperated, but it's individually rational not to cooperate. So his depiction, you know, in a nutshell of like all the problems in Montegrana. So the book is a wonderful book. It's just extremely, it's full of ideas and really interesting insights. But this is the kind of the big picture that the problem is this lack of cooperation, provision of public goods, and that's the outcome of this sort of equilibrium where everybody thinks everybody else is going to try to cheat them, so they better cheat the other person first, and this creates a very dysfunctional, low-level equilibrium. Okay? And he points out in many instances in the book how that sort of filters up to the institutions. Okay? His focus is on the society, but there's an interaction. Okay? There's lots of interactions. And let me give you a contemporary example from my work research in Colombia of, uh, of an interaction. So recently in Colombia, the president sort of forced all the ministers to reveal their assets. Okay? So they did that grudgingly. There was a bit of a delay. What did they do? They published asset declarations that are obviously completely fake. So people who fly to the United States on their private airplane declared that they had $400,000 worth of assets. Okay, so, so what do you do? So nobody was complaining. So I said to one of my Colombian collaborators, I said, what's, what's Leopoldo Ferguson? What's going on? And he said in this classic phrase, tienen rabo de paja. Now, the literal translation of that is something like, they have backsides of grass. I could, I could use another word, but not in polite company. <laughs> they have backsides of grass. So what does he mean, backsides of grass? Well, you know, Grass is sort of inflammable, and suddenly you might be sitting on a fire. So backsides of grass, that's another memorable thing to take away from this lecture, along with cow licking and US senators. Uh, backsides of grass means, you know, everybody has something, everybody's doing something wrong. You know, like everyone is cheating on their taxes, everyone is doing, you better keep your mouth shut, because if you start blaming other people, it's going to come back and bite you. So, so this is an interesting interaction, you know, between transparency. You know, when we talk about development policy and we talk about, you know, what should we be doing to promote better policies in developing countries, we should be promoting transparency, okay? But that's exactly what President Santos tried to do, but it's not very effective because it interacts with this social norm, with this kind of underlying equilibrium in society that makes it very difficult to promote transparency in that way because, you know, everybody has a backside of grass in Colombia. All right. So, gosh, all right. So what's the implications for policy? Now, you could say, 
there's no implication for policy. You just carry on doing the same thing you always did. All right? Maybe, you know, even imagine there's a, there's, a, there's a different equilibrium. There's an equilibrium here that poor countries are in, where people have backsides of grass. It's the prisoner's dilemma. We don't cooperate. You know, accountability doesn't work. You know, maybe that's a sort of low-level, underdeveloped equilibrium, but maybe the sensible thing is still to focus on regulating the monopolies and, you know, you know working on externalities and thinking about property rights. And, but I want to try to sort of make another suggestion to sort of say, maybe development policy should really about, be about changing the equilibrium. Okay? Now, but again, changing the equilibrium could be the same as just sort of improving on the equilibrium that you've got. And let me suggest that that could be right, but there's quite a bit of evidence that it's not right, okay? And let me just make two specific claims. One specific claim is if you thought about the experience of international development aid in the last 50 or 60 years, it hasn't done a very good job of improving on the equilibrium in poor countries. You know, in fact, the best estimates of the impact of foreign aid, for example, on economic prosperity is like zero. You know, some people would claim it's even negative, but to me, the best empirical work suggests it's sort of zero, which suggests that it's not so easy to perturb these equilibria. We actually did some work on this. I did some work with this, on this with my collaborators, Daron Ashimolu, Simon Johnson, and Pablo Kerubin, and we formulated a, what we thought was a fabulous piece of terminology which had a sort of about as little impact on the profession as you can imagine. So, but now I have a, now I have a captive audience. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try one more time. I'm feeling that cow licking is going to sink in kind of more effectively than this, but what the heck, okay? So let me give you some examples of what we called the seesaw effect, all right? So now with uh, the, the question I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get you to think, maybe the problem of underdevelopment is there are these multiple equilibrium. And there's these low-level equilibrium, like in Monte Grano in the south of Italy. And if you're stuck in that kind of equilibrium in a poor country, it's really hard to get out of it. Okay? So, but couldn't it be, that's what I'm trying to get you to think, couldn't it be that anyway the policy advice is the same? The way to think about policy is the same. Okay? So imagine you were in Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe, that's a poor country in southern Africa. GDP per capita in Zimbabwe is lower today than it was in 1980 when it became independent. It's a country with enormous development uh, challenges. Problems of inflation. You might think, ah, we know how to solve that. Make the central bank independent. That's even an institutional reform. Couldn't be better. We make the central bank independent. That's a way of solving inflation policy. That was a policy that was, that was introduced throughout Latin America, for example, in the 1990s. So let me show you what happens in Zimbabwe when you introduce central bank independence. So this red line is when the government in Zimbabwe passed a law to make the central bank independence, and this is the inflation rate here. Now, what happens after they introduced central bank independence was a hyperinflation happened. Now, one of the things you learn at the Harris School is not to confuse correlation with causality, okay? So it could be that introducing central bank independence caused the hyperinflation, okay? I think that's rather unlikely. Uh, what I want to use this as an example of is how in a place like Zimbabwe, where there's enormous problems with institutions, with the way everything works, introducing a central bank had no impact whatsoever on the underlying problems. Okay? Now, this isn't the seesaw effect. This is the warm-up. Here's the seesaw effect. So I mentioned that central bank independence also was introduced in many Latin American countries, for example, Colombia and Argentina in the 1990s. Okay? So the red line, again, is the date at which the central bank became independent. The thick blue line is inflation. So what happened in Colombia when they made the central bank independent? Well, the inflation rate came down. Great. What happened in Argentina? The inflation rate came down. Okay. What's this dotted line here? The dotted line is government expenditure as percentage of GDP. So what you see systematically in Latin America in the 1990s is that in places which introduced central bank independence, fiscal policy simultaneously deteriorated. So when 
The seesaw effect, you see? Now you're getting what a great piece of jargon that is. Because <laughs> when one end of the seesaw goes down, the other end of the seesaw goes up. And you're asking yourself, how come that didn't catch on? <laughs> OK, so what's the point of this? The point is to say, you know, you do a policy reform in a place like Colombia, where people have backsides of grass, then sure, maybe you can solve the problem of monetary policy by making the central bank independent. But that doesn't change the underlying equilibrium. So all the forces that previously created high inflation just sort of come out somewhere else in the system, and they lead the fiscal position to deteriorate. So I want to advance this as a sort of saying, maybe we need a different way of thinking about development policy. And maybe it's not right that the sort of beta-esque logic can be applied even in this context. OK? So, 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 and it's difficult. OK? There are some models in this literature, some ideas in this literature, dating all the way back to Thomas Schelling's great book, Micro Motives and Macro Behavior from the 1970s, that suggest, yeah, you know, the world may be divided into multiple equilibrium. And some of them may be better than others from the point of view of society. They may be Pareto ranked. But actually, it's not so difficult to change. You know? We just need to all coordinate on a different outcome. Okay? So Schelling was famous for developing this idea of tipping points. Okay? So, 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 so I'm, I'm, I'm giving you this example to show that, and I think this is the Colombian and Argentinian example sort of suggests this too, that this problem is... This problem is difficult, meaning there's a lot of stability about these underdevelopment equilibria. So Schelling's idea and it was that actually, you know, if we can all kind of re-coordinate, if society can all get together in one great, you know, what Thomas Hobbes called a covenant, you know, we can all change our behavior and we can all re-coordinate on the good equilibrium. And there's some examples in social science which are supposed to illustrate this. One of the most famous proposed uh, by Jerry Mackey who's a sociologist at University of California, San Diego, is, um, is female genital mutilation. So female genital mu mutilation, which he, ge he gave as an example, and many people have used as an example, is supposed to be a sort of canonical example of something which is disastrously inefficient for society. So this is bad for women. It's bad in every dimension for health. It has no benefit whatsoever. But Female genital mutilation is widespread in the world. So how could this be? And Mackey's explanation for that is, well, it's just like a sort of social norm that persists because, you know, I think I, think I should do it to my daughter and you think you should do it to your daughter and, and we'll be stigmatized if we deviate from this social norm. But if we could all just get together and say, you know, this is crazy, let's just abolish it, then uh, everything would be good. A foot, feet, feet binding in China is another interesting example. So the disappearance of foot binding in the 1920s in China is another example. So this sounds like, yeah, we may be in this Pareto inefficient equilibrium, but maybe it's not so hard to get out of it. You know, maybe we just need a charismatic leader to come along and lead us out of the wilderness and re-coordinate society. Ah, here's some very interesting research in, just published in Science last year about this. And with data from the Sudan, OK? So what's this red line? So this is, these are different communities. And this is the incidence of, uh, um, this is the incidence of female genital mutilation amongst uh, girls at high school. And this is, this is what, this is a paper by Ernst Fair, who's a distinguished behavioral economist at the University of Zurich, and his kind of team. He has a big team of people. And the red, what's the red, the red dots? The red dots are sort of meant to suggest this is what the world would be like if it was easy to change, right? So there's sort of one equilibrium where nobody does this, and there's another equilibrium where kind of everyone does it, and we can coordinate or one or the other. So this is like, this is the tipping point. This is what Schelling called the tipping point. But what's remarkable about this data is if you look across these villages in the Sudan, you see there's sort of every level of female genital mutilation. So, so there isn't sort of everybody coordinating on this practice or everybody not coordinating on this practice. There's actually enormous variation in heterogeneity in this. Now, there's lots of ways you could sort of think about this. Of course, you could say there's lots of heterogeneity amongst different societies in, and regions in the Sudan, which is certainly true. But it also suggests that 
This is a complicated practice, and if you, your goal was to eradicate female genital mutilation, you couldn't rely on some seamless re-coordination of people's social norms. It's a much deeper problem than that, and I think that's true of the problem of underdevelopment as well. Okay, so, so what are the entry points? I, when do I shut up? <laughs> I once, uh, yeah, I have some time, okay. I once gave a talk at the, the Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing, and it was very, there was a lot of miscoordination talking about Shelley. And so I got there, and I really didn't know what was going on. I had some slides, and, and so I asked the gentleman, I said, how long should I talk for? And he said, not more than four hours. <laughs> <laughs> so... No more than four hours. <laughs> okay, so, so, so now I'm sort of trying to get you to think, so maybe there's, there's this interaction, there's institutions, you know, that I did a lot of work on with Daron Nashamolu. If you read Why Nations Fail, you know that's all about institutions, extractive economic institutions, extractive political institutions. What I'm sort of suggesting now is that's all really important, but there's a society lying underneath that. And a lot of evidence has accrued in the last decade, you know, um, going back to Banfield, that's the 1950s, so that's a long time ago. But what's happened in the last decade is it's become much more quantitated, much more systematic. People have developed measurement tools for kind of thinking about these different ways societies function, the different ways people interact. And what I think is really interesting is that, to me, this resonates an enormous amount it resonates a lot with my personal experience in developing countries. To think about this interaction between institutions and society, you can think about you know, the backsides of grass, and you know, there's, you know, the, in, if you work in Africa, then it's you know, much more complicated in Africa. Uh, so, so, so here's an interesting way of thinking about this, and I'm going to come back to a policy example in a minute and try to make this a bit more real, but psychologists and experimental economists have been trying to think about this stuff. And how have they been trying to think about it? Well, they've been trying to think about, you know, imagine you have a society which is characterized by these inefficiencies. You know, that people don't cooperate with each other, they don't trust each other. You know, we know there's another equilibrium, let's say, where people do trust each other more, they cooperate more. How do we get from one to the other? Okay, and I think that's a very interesting way of thinking about development problems. There's a lot of work, I just started writing some papers down here. David Rand, who's, a, there's a lot of work at Yale. Uh, there's a whole uh, kind of social networks lab at Yale, and there's a political scientist, James Fowler, who's at UC San Diego, and Nicholas Christakis, who's actually started off as a doctor. You know, this is where all these examples of obesity and suicide come from. Uh, his early work was actually looking at this famous Framington Heart, heart Study, looking at illness and the spread of illness and how illness kind of w spreads through social networks. But what they're really interested in and in the, in the, in their collaborators is, you know, is imagine you have this sort of inefficient social equilibrium. What do I do to kind of push that in a more functional direction? How can I intervene to kind of get cooperation spreading through a social network or get trust spreading through a social network or get pro-sociality spreading through a social network. And they've been doing a lot of experiments, kind of lab experiments. David Rand is a psychologist at Yale. Field experiments, they have a massive project in Honduras in Central America looking at sort of different types of interventions. But the intervention here is not regulating a monopoly or you know, taxing a negative externality. It's trying to figure out how do you sort of perturb this kind of underlying equilibrium in society and push it in a more functional direction, okay? Now, you could ask, well, okay, you're intervening to try to get people to cooperate more. What about institutions? You know, shouldn't institutions get people to cooperate more? And, you know, institutions create incentives and people respond to incentives. And, you know, so from my perspective, you know, my problem with this work is a lot of it is sort of focusing just on people in a kind of very anonymous, you know, in, in a sort of setting where there are no institutions, where there are no kind of incentives created by institutional structure, and they don't really think about how you can alter that. And if I think about an experience of the successful promotion of kind of economic development, it seems to me you need all of that. You need to work on all margins at the same time and you need to think about how institutions and society kind of interact in these low-level equilibria and how you can push that interaction in a more functional way. And, you know, to me, 
The most interesting example of that, one of the most interesting examples, is the transformation in the US South in this country. There's a wonderful book uh, by an economic historian at Stanford called, uh, he's called Gavin Wright, and the book is called Sharing the Prize. And you'll see the title's very significant, as you'll see in a minute. And Gavin's book, I haven't got time to talk about it in great detail, or, <laughs> unless we were in Cuba uh, or, or China. Uh, but, 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 but let me just say, what Gavin's book is about is about the U how the US South transformed itself from a relatively backward, economically backward place in the 1940s into something that looks like the average place in the United States. Okay? Now, the first part of his book talks about the nature of the South in the 1940s, and he wrote two previous books about this, about what kept the South poor. You know, why was the South poor? There was little industry in the South. There was a history of very low levels of urbanization relative to the rest of the United States, a history of underinvestment in public goods, and of course there was an extremely dysfunctional social equilibrium. There was massive discrimination against black people in all walks of life. Black people couldn't get many different types of jobs. They couldn't get jobs in uh, industry and manufacturing, uh, for example. Their wages were far below black people in the rest of the country. And as a consequence of this transition, starting in the 1950s into the 1960s, the wages of black people, so this is, this is median black income uh, by these different regions, which were far below the rest of the country in the 1950s in the US South, converged to right up to where they are in the rest of the country. Okay? So when you think about you know, what was the impact of these changes in the South, here's one of the, the great gains, okay? that this enormous kind of exploitation and discrimination against African Americans disappeared. Okay? As a consequence of what? Well, as a consequence is clearly of institutional change. Okay? Institutions changed. The famous ruling of the Supreme Court in the 1950s, Brown versus Board of Education, was something which tried to change the institutional environment in the US South. But it's also true that many other things changed. Technology changed. During this period, there was an intense mechanization of cotton picking. So people, for people running the South, they didn't need to control this enormous labor force to pick cotton. Mechanization came. Okay? There was collective action by the civil rights movement. So the underlying social equilibrium changed dramatically as a consequence of uh, the mobilization of civil rights movement. There was a lot of migration previous to this out of the US South in the 19s, potentially in the 1940s during the Second World War. So what's interesting about the South is that this, is a, this was a revolution. It was an institutional revolution with enormous economic consequences for black people, of course, not just economic consequences, social consequences. They were able to vote for the first time. But it also was good for white people. Okay? So here's the thing about the title, sharing the prize. Okay, sharing the prize. Here's white wages, black wages, just in the south now. And you can see that while black wages were going up, white wages were going up too. And not just white wages, profits of white businesses as well. So what's fascinating about the history of the US South, if you're interested in development like me, is that here's an example of you know, what I was calling a sort of low-level equilibrium. You know, it was a very dysfunctional society, lack of cooperation, very antagonistic relationships between different groups, institutions that were very extractive, black people were excluded from political rights, they couldn't vote, extractive political institutions, extractive economic institutions, black people were kept out of large parts of the economy, and it disintegrated. Okay? So thinking about why it disintegrated as a consequence of all these shocks is very important, it seems to me. And I think if you think about what changed that, it was a lot of these things. It was institutional change, it was social change, the way people related to each other. President Eisenhower, after Brown versus Board of Education was passed by the Supreme Court, President Eisenhower sort of threw up his hands and said, laws and force can't change a man's heart, you know? The Southerners are just the Southerners and that's never gonna change. But he was wrong, you know, people did change. I always like this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. in response, it may be true the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless 
It may be true that the law cannot make a man love me, but it can keep him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important also. <laughs> so there's an interaction between the formal institutions, the underlying social equilibrium. I think, you know, this view is not right. I think what's interesting is the, the terrific change also in people's sort of underlying behavior as well as the institutions. And I want to say, you know, we can talk about all of these different effects, you know, the mechanization of cotton picking, Brown versus Board of Education, the role of US Marshals. Hmm. Outsiders are very important in perturbing this equilibrium. Gavin Wright, Gavin got very interested in this topic when he was an undergraduate because in the early 1960s, he was going down every summer and registering black voters. The, uh, Dr. Richard Pearson, who's the person whose professorship I'm named after, who was the father of the Pearson brothers, who created the Pearson Institute, he spent every summer in the 1960s going down to the South and helping black voter registration and the civil rights mobilization. And you're going to see why I emphasize this, because when we come down to thinking about public policy and people like you, you know, development policy, I know there's many spheres of public policy. You know, there's working for the government in Illinois, but if you're thinking about development policy, a lot of you are probably thinking about, you know, I want to get a job in the World Bank, or I want to work for an NGO, or I want to work for USAID, USAID or UNDP. I want to kind of make a difference. I want to try to help development problems. And, you know, you're probably sitting there thinking, oh, more pessimism from Robinson, you know? Uh, that last chapter in Why Nations Fail, that's pretty pessimistic. And now, you know, things are looking even worse. You know, there's, a, there's these painting this picture of this underdevelopment equilibrium with these kind of interlocking institutional problems. This, they're interlocking with this sort of society, you know, like the south of Italy underneath. And, you know, how on earth do you ever change that? Well, here's an example of change. Here's an example of dramatic change, okay? And it's an interesting change. Lots of things going on, society changing, institutions changing, and outsiders playing a pivotal role, you know, leaving aside the role of the US Marshals and the National Guard. Uh, outsiders played a very important uh, role, okay? Now, sharing the prize, let me come back to sharing the prize. You know, I said, if you look at these models of multiple steady states or even Schelling's model of tipping point, it's very usual to have Pareto-ranked equilibrium. Okay, and you know, you might be completely skeptical about that. You might think, you know, well, development, how could that, some people must be benefiting from underdevelopment. And in fact, that's the theme in Why Nations Fail, if you read it carefully. But I want to point out what's so interesting about the South is sharing the prize. I showed you what happened to white wages. Somehow, this equilibrium that the South got itself into, you know, after the end of slavery, after the Civil War, was really dysfunctional for everybody concerned. And I think what's interesting about this kind of image of multiple steady states is it helps you keep focused on the idea that, gosh, you know, we're all losing from this. You know, we're all losing from this in a poor country. And I think that's very important. I, a couple of years ago, when my book came out, I went and I gave a lecture to the Senate in Mexico about it, in Mexico City. And then some senators arranged for me to have a dinner with these businessmen, what they called progressive businessmen. I, I was more interested in talking to the reactionary businessmen, actually, but, but they, they set up this meeting with the, they set up this meeting with the progressive businessmen. And, you know, we were talking about Carlos Slim and all of that, you know, and this one guy said to me, he said, look, you know, forget Carlos Slim. You know, Carlos Slim, he's just a sort of exception. Set Carlos Slim aside, you know, big picture. Who's richer? Mexicans, us Mexican monopolists, or the people running Samsung and Hyundai? We're, we're pathetic, you know, and he told me, he said, how much money can you really make with the beer monopoly in Yucatan? You know, it's, it's small potatoes. It's small potatoes. And I think what he was trying to get across is this idea, we're all trapped in this situation, and even those of us who have a kind of economic stake in this underdeveloped equilibrium, we'd all be much better off if somehow we could just push this thing in a different way and create a very different type of equilibrium in Mexican society, okay? So, 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 so I guess I'm trying to, I'm going to shut up now. <laughs>
Uh, and I want to say, you know, why I emphasize that example, sharing the prize, thinking about, you know, who benefits from development and to what extent are these distributional problems a kind of source of underdevelopment? I think they are, but maybe the way to think about that is they are, but they're sort of low, they, they are locally, they're locally, you know. So if you think about around an equilibrium, then if you perturb the equilibrium, the, 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 the people running the beer monopoly in Yucatan are going to be worse off. But, but the big picture is, if you could get rid of that equilibrium and push the country to a different equilibrium, everybody would be better off, including the people with the beer monopoly or working in the competitive beer market in Yucatan. Okay? So, 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 so that's, that's the image I want to get across. So how does that happen? Okay? I emphasize in my discussion of the seesaw effect. Remember, the seesaw effect, it's like tripping off your tongue. The seesaw effect, the seesaw effect. <laughs> Forget that stuff about cow licking, the seesaw effect, okay? So that's to emphasize, like a lot of our work that Daron and I have done, gosh, you know, these development problems, they're really difficult, they reproduce themselves, there's vicious circles. You know, how do we get out of that, okay? And what can outsiders do, you know? Well, outsiders can do a lot. Yeah, it's true that some countries, lots of countries that have dramatically improve their development experience in the last 50 years, Botswana, China, India, Mauritius, have done so because in some sense, you know, the domestic equilibrium changed. But I gave you some examples uh, from the US South to suggest, you know, outsiders played a pivotal role in change in the US South. And it's interesting, if you go back to Banfield's great book, at the last chapter, Banfield asks, you know, so how do we change this mess in the South of Italy, you know? How do, the Montegranese do things differently. And he points out, clearly a change in ethos cannot be brought about by the deliberate choice of the people of Montegrano. It's precisely their inability to act concertedly in the public interest which is the problem. So it's very difficult to kind of change as an insider trapped into this equilibrium. Sure, you can do it, you can try, but I think this sort of stuck in my mind when I read this book years ago, suggests that outsiders can play a critical role. The work of Fowler and Christakis, for example, a lot of that is sort of showing how you're an outsider. As you, if you come as an outsider and you connect yourself to a social network, you actually change the network. You change who's central in the network. You change who's influential in the network. You can create very different incentives. And, you know, I... I, 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 I I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to use this example in the context of a kind of heated discussion of the impact of unionization at the University of Chicago. But the fact of the matter is a folk wisdom amongst trade union organizers is that firms never unionize internally. Okay? Walmart is not going to unionize because somebody in Walmart solves the collective action problem for the workers in Walmart. Unionization comes from the outside. Okay, outsiders come and outsiders help the workers in a firm solve the collective action problem. And that's, that's very much in the spirit of what I have in mind. Okay, so this may be a conventional example, this may be a controversial example, but I think it's very telling as a way of thinking about the role of outsiders. You know, you want to be a development professional, you want to work in the World Bank, USAID, UNDP, whatever it is, you know, you've read all this stuff about how international aid hasn't helped economic development. What do you do about it? Okay, well, I'm saying here's a way of thinking about this problem. First of all, let's think about what does an underdevelopment equilibrium look like, and I'm trying to sketch some ideas. And what I'm suggesting is that this way of thinking about the world actually creates um, examples like the US South. You know, we should have more examples like that from the developing world, but we don't. Why is that? because people think about the problem of development in the wrong way. They don't think about the problem of development in the way that Gavin Wright or Dr. Richard Pearson or many other people who got involved in the US South in the 1950s and the 1960s thought about solving the problem in the US South. And I'm asking, why? You know, because it worked. And it was a powerful way of thinking about, they knew the society was messed up, the equilibrium was messed up, and they wanted to change the equilibrium, and they did it. That's what they did. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on, but if I could estimate the causal effect, that's an expression you'll be using a lot this year, if I can estimate the causal effect, 
of these outsiders in the US South, and I don't have any regressions on that, but if I did, my guess would be that role was very positive. Okay, so, so here's my view of development policy. Uh, in a nutshell, you know, development policy should look, look a lot more like the role of outsiders in the transformation of the US South, or, heaven forbid, <laughs> trade union activists unionizing a firm. His people really trying to disrupt an equilibrium. That's not how people in international institutions think about development policy. Unfortunately, it's not how my colleagues in the development economics profession think about development policy either. They're still stuck with Beta's paradigm. So, and I don't think that's delivered a lot of gains in terms of economic development in the last 50 years. There have been lots of gains, but they haven't been really accounted for by the application of beta style analysis to thinking about development. Okay, so there's many ways of, you know, there's many antecedents of this. You know, if you go back to the 1950s, scholars like Myrdal, you know, who won the Nobel Prize for his work, who actually also, Myrdal's an interesting example because he also wrote extensively about the problems of the US South, including in the 1940s, a beautiful book about the problems in the US South. But Myrdal wrote some famous books in the 19, two famous books in the 1950s about problem of underdevelopment where he sort of thought about it, you know, as from his perspective in some sense of multiple steady states and trying to get going this cumulative causation. He, uh, that's what he characterized it. The mechanisms I'm talking about today are, are very different from the way Myrdal uh, thought about it. But I, I want to end here by just sort of saying, you know, it seems to me you know, this is going beyond anything I could take from why nations fail. You know, we've been thinking a lot about this literature about networks and kind of how the underlying equilibrium in society kind of works, and that's one of the things that I'm doing a lot of research on in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But, but I think that this provides a powerful way of trying to think about why underdevelopment persists and maybe gives us a different way of thinking about how we address that problem. Not to say that externalities and public goods are not important, but I guess I would say all of those issues are sitting in a poor country, they're sitting in a society with a lot of problems which are probably much more pressing and much more fundamental, and maybe there's new ways of thinking about how you eradicate or shift that kind of equilibrium, and that's how I think about this problem of, you know, policy for development. Okay. That's it.